reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning from verse 23, what the Apostle Paul told the believers during this time. He said, For I received from the Lord that I, which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup of the supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. Sunday of uh, this month of October. I was thinking earlier today, it's time to wear <laughs> long sleeves again and uh, and coat. Uh, I really like to just wear barong because it's really so easy and relaxing. But we thank God for the weather, the uh, the season that He has given us, so we can have variety and we can always. Uh, appreciate uh, what he has created. Today also is uh, Pastor AJ's birthday, uh, October 5. <laughs> Happy birthday, Pastor AJ. And of course, we have uh, uh, those who have celebrated early this uh, month. Uh, Daniel Sa uh, Sager, the first. Uh, Anita Simpello, the first. Gabriel Joseph Marasigan, uh, October 3, and now it's Pastor AJ's birthday. And we still have a lineup of those who will celebrate their birthday this month of October. Parker celebrated uh, his birthday the 3rd too, right? Uh, October 3. So, uh, uh, although he's not here. All right, so uh, this month of October, is, as uh, Brother Ray uh, announced, we are going to have uh, the... Appreciation, uh, it's, it's actually Pastor's Appreciation Month, but here at ICA Family, we appreciate all of you. We appreciate all of us, uh, those of us, a lot, all of us who are doing ministry for the Lord, we would like to give you thanks and appreciate, we would like to give thanks to the Lord for you, for what you're doing, for God, uh, not for anyone else in this church. But it is all for the Lord. Any, anything that you're doing, even though uh, it's not being noticed by anyone, uh, the Lord knows. And we would like to thank you for what you're doing. If you are praying for uh, the, our, our pastors, if you are praying for one another, that is already a ministry that you're doing for the Lord. So whatever it is that you're doing for God, uh, we would like to uh, let you know that we thank you from the bottom of our hearts and so the the month of October will be appreciation month and at the same time we are also uh, going to have a series about stewardship about being uh, a true and a good steward so this morning we're going to start by uh, talking about uh, attitudes and I think this is where everything boils down in our stewardship. So before that, let's open in prayer. Let's commit this time to the Lord. 
Our Father in heaven, we thank you for another day that you have given to each one of us. Um, every day, Lord God, is a gift from you. And so help us not to take for granted. Uh, every morning, we are so thankful that we're able to wake up, we're able to stand up, we're able to do what we desire and what we have planned to do. And today, Lord God, is one of those days that we're thankful because you are faithful, because you, um, you have promised that you will sustain us every day. And today, Lord, we thank you for your words that uh, will be spoken to us. I pray that you will continue to minister to each of our needs this morning. Help us to remember that you are our God and that there is no other God besides you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> There was uh, an elderly woman uh, in one of the services. Her name uh, was Mary. So while the pastor was preaching during the service, she fainted and bumped her head on one of those pews, and she lost consciousness. And so an, an EMT in the service called 911, and then, uh, uh, of course, the, 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 the guys came in, and uh, while she was being strapped to the stretcher, she gained her consciousness back, and she motioned for her daughter to come close. And the people in the church and the congregation was like observing and everything. They were thinking that she's going to say her last words to her daughters. So when her daughter came closer, Mary whispered to her daughter and said, My offering is in my purse. Please don't forget. To give it. Very remarkable, right? You know, of all things that she can think, she could have be afraid of her life, but she's so focused because that day she had prepared her life, her heart, to honor God because she had prepared something for the Lord. Stewardship. So what is stewardship? Stewardship means using our God-given ability to manage God-given resources to accomplish God-ordained purposes. That's one definition of stewardship. I want you to memorize that. It's not in your notes. It's not in the PowerPoint because we don't have PowerPoint today. We're going to read our text later on. But let me repeat it again. Stewardship means using God-given abilities to manage God-given resources to accomplish God-ordained results or purposes. So it embodies, that definition embodies the whole meaning and definition of being a steward. I'd like for you to write it down, maybe, and it's just short. You can memorize it, put it in your heart, and carry it with you wherever you go. Why? Because this is, this is very important. When we think of stewardship, we think of just giving our resources, giving our money, giving uh, our tithes and our offerings. And, you know, it's just when you give your money to the church or to the Lord, it's, it's merely part of stewardship. And, and you cannot be a steward without giving something, right? So, but that is not the whole thing about stewardship. It's only part of being a good steward. So, if stewardship is not about giving your money, maybe it's about doing ministry, giving your abilities to God. Correct again, but... What you do in ministry for God is not stewardship either. It is a part of good stewardship because you cannot be a good steward without doing something and ministry for the Lord. So, if stewardship is not about what I can give and it's not about what I can do, what is it about? So you go back to the meaning of stewardship that we have just learned. All right? So this is it. Stewardship is about having the heart of stewardship. Did I confuse you with that? 
<laughs> the difference there is the difference there is in the heart. Stewardship is about having the heart of stewardship. In other words, good stewardship is a matter of attitude that stands behind your giving and your service. Did you get that? Stewardship or good stewardship is a matter of attitude that stands behind your giving and your service. It's not what you give or what you do for God. It's why you're doing it. I hope you get that. You can always give. You can always do ministry. But then you have a wrong attitude. Right? So if in the back of that is the foundation that you do it because of the right attitude before God, then you are being a good steward. Now, in Luke chapter 10, we'll see there that Jesus was teaching regularly, and then all of a sudden there's, there was a young lawyer who just challenged him. So open your Bibles to Luke chapter 10, uh, if it's going to appear in our screen then we'll be able to see that as well. Uh, reading from the New King James Version uh, of Luke chapter 10. Actually, uh, I put there, it's from verse 25. Exactly, right? Right. Uh, from verse 25 to 37. Okay, so let's go through these verses. Luke chapter 10, beginning from verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So this lawyer is a very learned man. He, he was testing Jesus, and he says, You know, hey, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So th he has an idea how, how this is going to be, but he's just testing Jesus. All right? So Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading about it? So he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. So meaning the, the lawyer knows his law, knows his Bible, knows the word of God. But then in verse 29, this is what he says. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? <laughs> That's what he asked Jesus. And who is my neighbor? All right, so beginning from verse 30, this is the passage where we call the parable of the good Samaritan. Very well-known, very popular parable. But we're going to learn a lot of things from this parable. Verse 30, then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him off of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him, and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come back, or when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, He who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, Go, and do likewise. This is the word of God, and may the Lord bless the reading of his words. The parable of the good Samaritan. 
This parable, brethren, is a parable about the attitude of stewardship. And whenever we read this verse, whenever we read this passage, we focus on, of course, the Good Samaritan. And then we hear a lot of messages, you know, almost condemning the priest and the Pharisee. And elevating the Good Samaritan. But while I was meditating on this passage, before we go through the, 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 the attitudes that we have, I mean, that we can see, I was just wondering um, what we think about this. This is a parable. This is a story, right? Uh, a parable is an earthly story with heavenly meaning. That's the meaning of the word parable. Uh, Jesus is throwing out those stories so that they will see themselves. It's like a mirror. When Jesus gives parable. He speaks it, and then they would see themselves through the parable. And this is exactly what's going on here. And I'm sure when Jesus gave this parable, he knew the hearts of those around him. He knew the heart of this lawyer. He knew the rest of the people in that area. So, my question is, when, when Jesus mentioned about the priest, and the Levites who just passed by. We're going to talk about it more a little bit. But then we, we, we think, hey, they, they don't really care, which is true. But then we think they're bad people, right? The priest, he's a bad person. He, he didn't even help the, the, the guy who was robbed and who was gasping for air and who's was uh, dying. And even the Levite. And these guys, these people are religious leaders. They are doing a lot of things. For God. That's what they said. But then my question is, are all priests bad? Are all Levites bad? And that, that's the picture that we see here, right? The answer is no. There are good people. There are good priests, and there are bad priests. And, there, and, and another question is, is this Samaritan person? Are, are all the Samaritan men good, like him? No. Right? So I just want to throw that to you today so that you will have the clear thinking, hey, all the Samaritans are good and all the priests are they're really bad. And the Levites, they really have bad attitude. So even here in our place, we have a negative thinking about our friends around this area. And I couldn't blame you. Sometimes I think the same because of how they um, deal with other people. But we're not going to go deeper than that. So, just there, okay? Now, we're going to see at least three uh, attitudes on display here about true stewardship. And many believers, churchgoers, exhibit at least one of those three. So, in this passage, we're going to see these attitudes. We're going to focus on these three. And maybe uh, you have heard this this saying or this attitude. The first attitude is this. What is yours is mine. I'm going to take it. That's the first attitude. It sounds familiar to you. I, I know some of you heard this already. What's yours is mine. I'll take it. And you say, no way. That's not me. You know, I share. I mean, I, I, I give. But that's exactly what the, the thieves did, right? In verse 30 the parable with, with this, and he said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, so from from Jerusalem to Jericho is a long way, not really long way, um, it's like maybe a how many days walk, and a lot of scholars say, uh, you know, when you walk from Jerusalem to Jericho, you're going to pass by you know, narrow roads, or narrow way, or like road, but not highways during the time, but it's like, you know, just like a road where a man or a donkey can go. And there's like rocks here, rocks there. You're in between. And you are prone to be uh, attacked, hold up, ambushed. And Jesus said, he's traveling and he fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. They took away everything that he owns. He, they didn't kill him. That's the situation right there, okay? So that's exactly the first attitude that you see all over the place. What is yours is mine. I'll take it. 
You don't have any right to own it. <laughs> it's all mine. And then we see, we say, uh, no, no, that's not acceptable. That's, that's evil. That's a violation of, of moral uh, situation in this, in this planet God has created. And yet, um, in Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 to 10, just to remind you, we're not focusing on this because every time we have stewardship, we think, oh, pastor is going to preach from Malachi chapter 3, you know, robbing God. All right? Just, me, just let, let me read this to you. All right? Malachi 3, 8 to 10, God speaks to Israel, will a man rob God? Yes, you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? God says, in tithes and offerings, you are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. Now, granted, that was under the Old Testament. They were commanded by God. The tithe was commanded in the law. And we're saying right now we are not under the law, which is true. We are under grace. We're not required to give our tithes. We are being expected by God to do that. We're not being punished if you don't give your tithes, right? You're not being ran after by Brother Oli and say, Hey, you haven't given your tithes for quite some time. That's not happening here, right? But when you go to other churches, not Bible-believing churches, if you don't give your tent, they're going to run after you. They're going to take some of your possessions if you cannot give your tithes. Because it's like a payment. But in the Bible, it's you bring, you don't pay. That's uh, another uh, sometimes mindset that we have. So, okay. Uh, all, all of this, I can't picture God feeling much different today. He's not requiring, He's not demanding. But he expected from us. So, whenever you go to a restaurant, not McDonald's, not uh, fast food, but nice restaurant, you eat, you get your fill, you're satisfied, you're happy, and before you go out the door, what do you do? You give your tip. And the tip is 10, 15, some of you even give 20%. Because you're so pleased, you're so happy. But if a person ate, get satisfied, went out the door without giving any tip, what will the waitress or the waiter think? Did I do a good job? A poor job? Or what? That guy, is, uh, is, he's, he robbed me. That family just robbed me. I served them. I gave my best. They didn't even give me a tip. Now, the question is, do you owe him or her a, a tip? No, you don't owe her or him as a waitress, as a waiter, a tip. But if he or she does a job well, then a gratuity is a show of your appreciation for what he did or she did to you, right? So, for us Christians, the tithe, as I've said, might not be required of us but if God is so important to you if God is who you say he is in your life if God is the reason why you're here this morning and you say you love him you pray to him you trust him then giving your tithe is a powerful way of showing your appreciation for what he did in your life all right, so that's the first attitude that some churchgoers exhibit. What is yours is mine. I'm going to take it. Maybe that's what you're doing right now. Maybe you're not even giving anything for the Lord. You're taking what belongs to Him. The second attitude is this. What's mine is mine. I'm going to keep it. So maybe a little bit better, right? I'm not taking what's yours, but I'm keeping what's mine. <laughs> right? Okay, verses 31 to 32 says, Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. 
And then it says, Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. See the difference between the, the priest and the Levite? The priest just from the distance, Oh man, I'm not going to go near that man. I'm scared. Okay? So he just saw it from afar and went the other way. But the Levite looked, maybe investigated. Oh, he's still alive. He's going to be fine. Somebody's maybe going this way. I have to go on my way. What is mine is mine. I'm going to keep it. As I said a while ago, these were men claimed to be doing works for God. They love to be praised in the synagogues. They love to be, they love to be heard in their loud prayers. They love to be uh, watched walking by their attire. And, and, and that's what they want to do. They were trained to serve God, but they're not going to do anything for this beaten man. Because in order for them to help this man, what is required of them, they have to give up something important to them. What are those things that are important to them? Their time, right? They might be in a hurry. You know, I have to catch a visitation, I have to catch somebody, I have to do this and do that. And then the resources, of course, yeah, they have to spend. They, they calculated everything already. If I help this guy, I have to bring him to the hospital, I have to bring him to the inn, and no way, I'm not going to do it. What else? Their personal comfort, right? Ah, what are other people going to say to me? Or, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ruin my clothing. I just laundered it. I just cleaned it. And the last one is that their personal safety. Right? We, we think about this all the time. What if that guy, I helped him, he sued me back. And so they've been trained to do religious things. They've been trained to do ministry. But when the time comes to do real ministry, they turn their heads away. Their attitude is, what's mine is mine, I'm going to keep it. They're not good stewards. All right. And too much for that. Let's go to the third attitude. And say, oh, oh, this is good. Third one. What's mine is yours, I'll share it with you. As I said a while ago, you know, not all Samaritans are good and perfect. It just so happened that Jesus thought about this to convey across a message so important for this lawyer, young man, to realize that, hey, you are responsible. You have to love your neighbor, whoever that person will be. All right, verses 30 to 37 says, But the Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. Right? That's the key word there. When he saw him, he had compassion. When you feel compassion, you are going to do something. And that's exactly what happened here. He had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Expenses, right? Cost him his resources. He has to do something right there. Help this guy before he brings him to a place where he can really, really rest. And he sent him on his own animal, brought him to an inn. Sacrificed his personal comfort. His personal... Uh, a comfort zone in his life and then he took care of him on the next day when he departed that means he spent the night at the same place where uh, the guy that, uh, that was hurt was he took out two denarii gave, him, gave them to the innkeeper and said to him take care of him and whatever more you spend when I come again I will repay you so which of these three do you think was a neighbor to him who fell among the thieves and uh, the lawyer finally realized, and he said, He who showed mercy on him. And then Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. What an eye-opener to this lawyer who thought that he's going to heaven because he loved the Lord with all his heart, with all his mind, with all his strength and his everything. But it's hard for him to love his neighbor. Now he realized that. 
Now, let's go back to this Samaritan man. This man was not even trained in ministry. Because the Samaritans and the Jews are not friends. They are enemies. They are despising each other. They are, they are just, you know, they can't get along. And this Samaritan was probably not, uh, uh, as, as rich as the Levite or the Pharisee. Maybe everything that he has there is enough for his family. And this Samaritan is also a busy man. Like the, the, the Levite and the priest. He has a family maybe. He has a schedule to catch because he's traveling. And so everything, every excuse that the Levite and the priest had, he has an excuse too. But the only difference is that his attitude. That's the only difference there. His attitude. He had compassion. When you had compassion, you were going to do something. And the Samaritan's attitude helped him, first of all, overcome his prejudice. If you're following the outline there, it's blank there. So that's the first thing. He overcome his prejudice. And then he ignored the inconvenience. And then he gave up his possessions to take care of this man. What an attitude. So, what's the right attitude for a good steward of God? What is the right attitude? It's the attitude of ownership. Okay? It's the attitude of ownership. What is the attitude of ownership? Do you think you own everything? No, God owns everything. That's the attitude that Jesus wants to convey to the lawyer and to the rest of those people who are listening to him. Jesus is trying to say, I, I own everything. And that's what God is saying. I own everything. We don't own anything. So again, if you're a steward, that means... You are you're willing to use your God-given abilities, all right, to help those who are in need, your resources, so that God's preordained purpose and plan will be accomplished. It's not for us. It's not about us. It's about the Lord. So again, I have another uh, definition of, of steward here. What is a steward? Brother Ray mentioned this a while ago. A steward is someone who takes care of something for someone else. Right? We're taking care of everything for God. Okay? Now, if you are rich right now, you have, you have workers, right? And they're responsible to you. You have stewards, right? But if you're working for a company, a com the company is... You are responsible to the company, and you are being a steward of the company. The company is expecting you to do your best to perform and to be efficient in everything that you do because you are a steward. You want to be paid. You want to keep your job. That's why you are there. You are working. Okay? So if you are a steward, you don't own what you have. If you're working for a company, you don't own the company. Right? Somebody else owns the company, maybe a corporation. And then the corporation is also responsible to the government. See, the government is always in control of everything. You cannot put up a business without going to the government because you're going to be in trouble. But God is the sole owner of everything. All right? So if I'm going to be a steward for God, I need to decide, I need to make up my mind, I need to have the right attitude that I don't own my time, my money, my possessions, my life. Now, are you ready to do that? Or some of you may be already doing it. You have resolved to yourself that I don't own my time, I don't own my resources, I don't own my possessions, I don't own my money, I don't own even my life. Have you resolved that before God in your life? Or you're still holding on. You say, oh, this is mine. <laughs> I don't want to share this. 
So, again, let me repeat. If you're going to be a steward for God, you have to make up your mind. That's the reason why we're going to have this stewardship month. We're starting with this one. Because the following messages on stewardship will not make any sense to all of us if you're not going to resolve this. And we'll just hear a good sermon next Sunday and the following Sundays until we're done. And maybe some of you are already thinking, oh, I can't wait to have the last message on stewardship so I can rest hearing about being steward. Beloved, let's that's, that's, that's realize that it's, it's God. It's God who owns everything. And when you resolve that to yourself, then the rest will just follow. And it's not easy. You always have to make that decision. It's not a one-time decision. You have to resolve that to your life every day as you surrender your life to Him. So if... Uh, you made that decision in your life that you don't own your time, then I expect, God expects to hear from you that when a ministry is needed, you will not be able to say, oh, I'm sorry, pastor, or I'm sorry, uh, it's well leader. I'm sorry, I really don't have time. Who owns the time? Not you. Not me. So you can never say, I don't have time. Right? You can always say, I'll find time for that. But we think we own our time. Oh man, I have to take care of this. I have to take care of that. I have to do this. I have to do that. I don't think I can have time for that. But again, you need to realize you don't own the time. God owns it. So why not allow God to say, Lord, I'm willing to put down what I'm doing to be able to attend to this one because I know this is what you want me to do. They are called divine interruptions. It happens to me all, the, not all the time, but whenever that happens, sometimes I struggle, sometimes, Lord, um, I still need to finish this. I still need to finish my message. But then I need to attend to that. So if you have given your time to God, you will never be able to say, I don't have time. From now on, you can change your dialogue and say, I will find time for that. How about money? If you don't own your money, then you can never say, I don't have money to give to the Lord, to the ministry. Lord, I don't have enough for my family. Can I not give today? Possessions. Oh, man, we have a lot of this. And you see this every garage sale in somewhere. Right there. And I'm happy to see some of us, you know, give up a lot of stuff that we have in the house and just get rid of it. Because other people might benefit from it. A lot of them. How about your life? Well, yeah. The Bible says if you try to keep your life, you will lose it. But if you're willing to give up your life for the sake of Jesus Christ, you will gain it. So they all belong to God. I just manage them. And it's not easy to master this attitude. That's why I'm giving it to you. That's why I'm learning from this as well. Because we're all going to learn from this together. At one time, at the city of temple, or at the city temple in London, there was in the congregation a restaurant owner named Emil Midler. Maybe you've heard of him. And uh, Emil uh, Mittler uh, was a close friend of a mission, a mission agent or, or leader named Albert Schweitzer in Britain. Mittler would never allow a Christian worker to pay at a meal or for a meal in his restaurant. 
I'd like to go to that restaurant. <laughs> but if you're a Christian, you're free. That during that time, it's long, long time ago. So he would never allow a Christian to pay in this restaurant. So if you're a Christian, you go there, eat, and then you go out. Maybe you can give a tip. <laughs> One day, it happened when he was opening his cash register that the uh, secretary of the London Missionary Society was there. And to the surprise of the secretary, when he opened the cash registry, among the cash and the coins was a six-inch nail. And the secretary was like, what is it doing there? What's the nail doing there? And Mittler explained, I keep this nail with my money to remind me of the price that Christ paid for my salvation and of what I owe him in return. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that a powerful reminder that a six-inch nail is there to remind him of what he owed Jesus Christ and what he wants to do for him. Now again, let me say that the idea behind this series of messages about stewardship is the goal that I have in my heart is for us to get to that level of our stewardship. If you're already giving, you can elevate it. If you are not giving at all, it's time for you to start and to be in that level of stewardship. And what is that level? The level of stewardship where we are constantly reminded of the price Jesus paid for our salvation. Beloved, if you really appreciate your salvation, do not struggle to give for the Lord. There's no amount of money to pay, right? You're not paying your salvation off. You're not paying your loan of your salvation. But it's a gratitude that God has saved you. And that's the level of stewardship that I'd like for all of us to be. That gratitude that God has saved us. Can you imagine if you're not saved right now, you might be somewhere else? Maybe wasting your life, wasting your money on something else. And you don't have any hope in life. You don't have assurance of your salvation. And so now that you have Jesus Christ in your heart, now that you're here, God is telling you, this is how you show your appreciation. Resolve to yourself that God owns everything. I don't own anything. That's why you will not be able to, to struggle. And so, the challenge for us today is if you have never tithed in your life, I would like for you to try God. Not try me, not for the sake of the finances of ICF, but just you and God. Try Him. Because this is what, again, Malachi 3 says, Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. Now, the remaining verses in Malachi says this, I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. The background here is that when the Israelites just came to the promised land, they were so busy uh, building their own livelihood. You know, plant here, plant there, you have to work, you have to establish your family. They forgot God. They forgot to bring the tithes into the storehouse so that the, the Levites, those who are singing in the temple, those who are ministering in the temple can have their support because they're not allowed to work. They're just depending on the tithes, the 10% of their harvest, their first fruits. And so God is saying, you're robbing me. And you are 
putting your brothers in danger because they don't have any support. And then God says, if you do that, <laughs> just test me. I'll just, I'll just pour out blessings on you. True enough. When the Israelites, one time when they were obeying God, when they were bringing their tithes and offerings, sometimes they, they plant and they harvest ten times what they have planted. Why? Because they are committed to bring to the temple, to the Lord, what belongs to Him. It's the same with us. If we are thankful to God for our salvation, if we are giving above and beyond our tithes, God will honor that. And I know some of you can testify that. I've heard testimonies where, you know, some of you are struggling at first to give your tithes, but then as you start and you have trusted God, He never failed. The thing is, have you trusted God? Have you tried Him? If not, that's the challenge today. Try Him. And for the rest of the month, do that. And just see how God will respond to that. Do it with a heart that is trusting God. Not is, God, I'll do this because I know you'll bless me. <laughs> Sometimes the return is not monetary. But it's, it's all worth it all. And so if the promise was good for those under the law, how much more do you think God will be faithful to us who are under His grace? And in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul exhorted, right? On the first day of the week, set aside. Okay, set aside. We're not bringing first fruits, first harvest, but what belongs to God in honor of Him and in our love for Him. Let's bow our heads to pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank You for loving us. And there's no amount of gift and money and riches that can compare, that can equal Your love and the price You paid for our salvation. And Lord, we thank You that you have reminded us through the life and through this parable of the Samaritan that we need to resolve to ourselves that we don't own anything. You own everything, Lord God. And help us to always remember that. And help us to hold on to that. Because if you own everything, then we know that our needs also will be provided. Thank you for your words for us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.